Hey, it looks like we're recording. How's everybody doing this week? Uh, I hope everybody's doing fine. Uh, this class is scheduled for August the 2nd, 2021. So we're already in a new month in August. And that should be fantastic. It seems September took a long time, but uh, now we're in August. So uh, today we're gonna talk about the Mongols and uh, the early parts of Mongolia. And uh, without further ado, let me try to get to the material. Okay. So, so you know, I, I think I have a ghost in here. It runs around and does things. So I have to tell the ghost that I have to work now. So let me minimize myself. There we go. That's all it took was one second to minimize. Okay, ghost, please go away. Okay, um, so I usually go to the slideshow, but I guess I can just go there and then go to the, from the beginning. All right, perfect, make perfect. Or as the kids say, Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So let's hope that ghost doesn't come back and make more trouble like it likes to do. So, uh, World Civilizations 2, let me hit the screen. Is this thing responding? Oops, I, did you see that week five? No, you didn't see that. Okay, so week five. So that probably means that uh, following week, we will have a Mid-time, yes, mid-term, correcto? Yes, so, but not this week. This week we're fine, we're doing good. Don't have to worry about that, okay? So let me get to the material. I'll get to the sidebar later, which again, for my new people or the people who sleep during the lectures, none of this stuff you really have to know, but it's just good reference points for you to uh understand okay all right the mongols unify eurasia which means you know your history about the mongols they were a bunch of various different step which is the open grassland of mongolia uh peoples and uh there's a fellow we all know by the name of Genghis khan or Genghis. His original name was the temujin his uh, great, 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 great grandson usually goes to the school and uh, he unifies all the different tribes and makes them one powerful nation for the first time. Okay, so let's get into the specifics here. All right, the Asian world in the period after the decline of the Abbasid Caliphate in the West, so remember Caliphate has to do with Islam. And the fall of the Tang Dynasty, or maybe Tang Dynasty, and we know that's in China. And the East was in a state of almost continuous upheaval, which means endless fighting, endless battles, okay? Waves, which means hundreds upon thousands upon Thousand thousand groups of people, and what kind of people were they? Um, nomadic, which means they kind of travel a lot. And this is due to the fact that they live in the uh, what the Mongols call yurts or yurta, and sometimes the weather's just too cold, and they need to have areas where their cattle. Uh, sheep mostly can graze and eat, so they have to move to another area. So they don't have like a permanent stone home like uh, other folks do, big city people. So these waves of nomadic pastoral, and pastoral means out in the fields, people emigrated out of the steppes of Central Asia, seeking new pasture lands for their flocks. Again, cattle, sheep, chihuahuas, and wealth to plunder, which unfortunately means uh, they found people with some kind of wealth 
gold, riches, um, some of these folks might uh, take it from them, might steal it by force. In the lands of Islam, between the 9th and the early 13th century, this immigration was experienced as a relatively peaceful arrival of Turkish tribes. China, on the other hand, already had a long history of attacks by Turco, Mongolian, and the Chinese called them barbarians, I guess because they did not have these uh, structured cities and try to cultivate you know, a luxurious lifestyle. So these people just lived off the land, in a sense, wild. Uh, and so these barbarians from the North and West, for most, the most part, both of these great civilizations, uh, meaning Islam and uh, China, had found ways of dealing with such nomadic peoples in the Islamic East by converting them. So what that means is the Turco, Turkish tribes or Mongolian tribes that went over there and fought, some of them were converted into Islam. So once they took the faith, then they became part of the Islamic East and um, gave up the purpose of trying to attack and steal. Uh, in China, they were bribed, which means they were given money to go away. And the building of the Great Wall kept them out also, okay? In the 13th century, these methods no longer worked. Okay. You could not bribe them. Uh, I guess they found ways around the Great Wall and maybe a lot of them did not want to become uh, Islamic. The civilizations of Asia and Eastern Europe were about to experience an invasion at the hands of a new step force, the Mongols. This meaning the whole unified Mongols, not just some very you know, weak tribes, you know, or Turkic people, but a whole unification of peoples. Um, so, you know, I have to have a question, but uh, let me uh, go through the sidebar. Okay, so just some numbers, some dates, which you don't have to remember. Uh, 960 to 1279 was the Song Dynasty in China. 1167 through 1227, the uh, life of Genghis Khan. So if you put those numbers uh, together, he lived uh, 60 years, that's uh, it. Uh, which actually is um, not bad considering the time and considering how many battles he fought. I mean, we have people in uh, American people in the uh, Western times, you know, 1850, 1860, around the time of the Civil War and after, and it wasn't, uh, uh, or it was very common that a lot of people just live till their 40s. So, wow. Uh, what's going on there, but not good. Uh, 1221 to 1258, Mongol conquest of Persia, which is the current day Iran, but they're talking about Persia's empire. So uh, if you saw the movie 300 many years ago, Persia's empire included many different countries. So uh, we're not talking about just the present day Persia. And then uh, Iraq was also very powerful at the time. 1227 to 1279, the conquest of China. Okay. Took a long time though. China was strong. Uh, 1227 to 1480, the Khanate of the Golden Horde in Russia. So we'll learn about the Khan. That's like you heard Genghis Khan. Khan is a title. Like I said, his original name was Temujin. So when you become a Khan, you have a Khanate in the kingdom, and uh, he had a big one in Russia eventually. Uh, well, generally his sons, you know, took that on. Uh, 1258 to 1349, uh, Khan II dynasty in the Islamic heartland. So uh, again, he conquered a lot of it, and I guess most of them did not want to become Islamic, you know. 1260, Mongols defeated finally at Ain Jalut. And then 1271, 1368, Yuan Dynasty in China. So uh, let me get to my question. I only have one question here. Okay, is this thing gonna work? Come here, baby. All right. 
whiteboard, pencil. Now, unfortunately for me, this is going to be another week of very long questions for me and short answers for you. So I got my work cut out for me. Maybe if I get my spelling correct. Okay, let me see how, I don't think I can stretch this too much. There's no way I can make it a onesie. Does it look good? Can I make it a twosie? All right, Tuesday's good. Uh, before the 13th century, which techniques did not work to keep the Mongols out anymore? So the meaning here is they used to work and now they didn't. So just uh, list those two techniques. I'll give you a minute on that. So prepare folks, uh, usually August is the, if you're, if you're not from here originally, or this is your first summer here, uh, August is the hottest month. So get ready. We've had our heat wave, but August is gonna be worse. So we gotta be strong. All right, you probably got a grasp on that. So let me hit the eraser. All right, repeating before the 13th century, which techniques did not work, or should I say did not work anymore to keep the Mongols out of China? Okay. It's done. All right, I'm trying to go back to the material. All right, so we ended here at the bottom of the new steppe land force. They were about to experience the invasion of the Mongols, the unified group of these folks. Very powerful at this point. Oops, I think I overstepped my boundary here. Do a previous, yay. Okay, we're set. Uh, the Mongols, uh, before their conquests, the Mongols were a relatively small group of steppe nomads. Their sources of food were relatively, I'm sorry, were their herds of livestock, like I mentioned before, and what they could obtain by hunting. While their small but strong Mongol ponies, which are small horses, served them as both a mode of transportation and a food source. Uh, so I guess they're implying that they also ate their horses if they had to. I don't know if Mongols to this day still eat horses. I know I've had some students that told me that they eat camel, so that doesn't sound strange. Uh, being nomadic, they lived in felt tent-like structures called yurts made out of horse hair. And their highest level of leadership was the tribal warlord or Khan. So that's why we get later Genghis Khan. It wasn't his last name at that time. Right, it was a title. Uh, pastoral nomadism throughout the history. Pastoral nomads existed on marginal desert or steppe land, prairie grasslands that was unsuitable for agriculture. So there you go. If you can't grow agriculture, you need livestock. And then if it gets too cold, you got to move. That's why a nomadic 
So rather than depending on seasonal crops as farmers did, they adapted to the more restrictive environments in which they live by learning to breed and raise livestock, such as camels, dromedaries, goats, sheep, horses, and yaks to satisfy their primary needs. These animals furnished milk, meat, and even blood for the food and fermented beverages on which they depended. Fermented beverages meaning alcohol, a nice horse milk alcohol, uh, as well as hides and hair uh, from which they created clothing, carpets, and shelter for themselves. Generally speaking, pastoralists enjoyed secure ways of life and cultures that were as rich as those of the more settled neighborhoods or cities. However, constant resource shortages obliged them or forced them to be continuously on the move in search of water, suitable grazing lands for their flocks, and alternative sources of food. So these folks were used to constantly hunting. Because of their different ways of life, pastoralists and farming people's dealings with each other were often tense and warlike. They depended on each other for products each of them needed, farmers for meat and livestock that pastoralists could provide and pastoralists on cultivators for the products of field and farm. So vegetables, uh, trade was the predominant form of intercourse or communication between herding and agriculturally based civilizations. But when the severe want or shifts in the balance of power followed peaceful conditions, episodes of raiding, which means stealing or outright conquest, which means we just took you over, typically broke out. Uh, peoples like the Arabs, the Turks, and the Mongols were organized to be constantly prepared for raiding and warfare. So they wandered along the borders of the ancient civilizations of Western and Eastern Asia as constant threats to the peaceful existence that farming people's settled ways of life demanded. Pastoral peoples were usually organized in tribes, which were subdivided into clans. Their usual form of military action involved raiding for livestock and slaves, but they sometimes conducted more prolonged campaigns, which means longer, to seize pasture land and water rights. So they're, in, they're not just talking about taking what's inside your house or your city. They want the land for the water rights or the pasture area for their own livestock. And then they extend control over subject populations. They choose tribal leaders from Turco-Mongolians called Khans on the basis of their personal wealth and charisma. So guys, if you don't got a lot of wealth, start working that charisma. And above all, for their military skills, or if you've got good military skills, I think Temujin here has good military skills. Uh, nearly always, these were males. So it doesn't say always, it says nearly. So sometimes you had some strong ladies, like I guess I have in my class, there's a lot of strong ladies. Little evidence survives concerning the roles of women among the Mongols, however. Women from the families of Khans are thought to have participated in the management and negotiation of tribal affairs. Recent archeological discoveries of burial mounds of the Western Asian Scythian, which right, isn't that out of Star Wars, right? The Sith, right? Nomads suggest that nomadic women sometimes fought as warriors uh, alongside the men. Grave mounds containing female remains accompanied by weapons, shields, 
and various symbols of wealth and honor lend to support this thesis or theory. DNA taken from these skeletons has matched samples taken from some modern Mongol women. Oh, oh modern Mongol women, there's a connection providing evidence that the ancient Scythian Amazons, which means tall, strong warrior women, were the direct ancestors of these women. So maybe Tugs or Inky or Babs, maybe you girls are the ancestors, or no, the successors of the ancestors. Yeah, it's Am Amazon blood. Like other pastoral nomads, the prime advantage of the Mongols in war was their ability to cover long distances. And we're talking about miles, not just, oh, nine blocks, you know, no. More rapidly, faster than any of their settled enemies. So they could travel in a fast, fast way on their horses, much more than the settled agricultural population. Virtually living on their small hardy, which means strong ponies, Mongol warriors combine the tactic of surprise in an uncanny accuracy. Uncanny is, um, what that means is that it's almost like an unbelievable ability, so an accuracy to do something. You know, you just, you're like, the guy did that thing 10 times in a row and he didn't make a mistake or maybe more, that's uncanny. Okay, I think I wanna turn on the, Aircon here. If I could uh, find the remote, but I guess I can't. So uh, I'm gonna have to stay hot. How do you like that? Nice. So I have to continue and finish this, and then you know the questions are coming. Uh, like other pastoral nomads, the prime advantage of the Mongols. So I got that. Okay, virtually living on small hardy ponies. So the tactic of surprise. So they're attacking these folks when they least uh, expect it. And you have to add the fact that their uncanny accuracy with the bow and arrow. So they really could hit you many, many times. I guess like a person that has a high level skill with a gun, but that bow and arrow, boy, bong, bong, bong. and they use it against infantry opponents. So basically people that were not on top of horses. They usually bypassed walled strongholds, AKA the Great Wall, against which a cavalry charge would be ineffective. And they starve their enemies into submission through their control of the surrounding countryside. So what that means is that they could wait it out. If they could control the whole outside area, I guess where uh, food was brought in and different things that they needed. But then eventually people behind, let's say, smaller fortifications or areas of the Great Wall, they would give up because they're starving to death, you know? So smart tactics, they changed their tactics. Okay, so um, at the end, bottom of this page, so I've got a couple of questions to ask you. Back to the whiteboard. In my pencil. Question two. Let me make sure I'm asking this correctly. So let me check this. Okay, there we go. Okay, time for some stretchy pool. Can I make it a one? Oh, there we go. Uh, so describe the Mongols existence 
before their conquests. What that means is what kind of lifestyle did they have before they started conquering uh, other countries and empires, okay? That's what I want to uh, know there. My second question. which is question three, totally. Again, a long question and your answer will be short. Okay, I have to check this one too. All right. Okay, stretch time. I can make this a onesie. There we go. Name some advantages the Mongols had in war. So the kind of thing I'm looking for, but you guys cannot be silly, is, uh, you know, did they have tanks? You know, I'm being silly because there was no tanks then. Did they have big uh, battleships? Did they have an air force? What are some things that they had that had advantages over the people that they were attacking, okay, at the, at the beginning? All right, so let me give you a few to answer those. Okay, you guys done with that? I finally, talking to myself here, I finally found the remote for the AirPod. Hot! That gummit. Okay. All right, so you got those two? I hope so. They're not long. Okay, let me get the eraser. Oh, thank you, Aircon. All right, eraser, where are you? Okay. Two. Describe the Mongols' existence before their conquest. Again, repeating, what kind of lifestyle did they have before they became conquerors of uh, many parts of the known world at that time? Okay, did the Mongols all work at the, at the local Kmart? Is that what they did? I don't think so. Three, name some advantages that the Mongols had in war. So I named my silly advantages just so that it would make you think. So there's a couple that were stated here, so that should have been easy. Right, let's go back to the material. I ended here on the bottom where it says they starved their enemies into submission through control of the surrounding countryside. Okay, there's a picture there. Let's go over a little bit. Mongol archer, again, we talked about the archery. There were no guns at the beginning of their conquest. Mongol soldiers typically traveled with as many as five ponies because they provided swift transport as well as a food source. So what they're trying to tell you there is, you know, if the guy only had one and then they reached an area in their long travels where they couldn't eat for a few days, they couldn't very well eat their only one pony. But if they had a few, then they could sacrifice a couple to eat in a long journey. 
uh, the Mongols' ability to carry out lightning attacks, which is describing the speed, and to fire accurately from the backs of these mounts was the key to their military success. So if this is what you answered before. Bingity, bongity. There it is. Kind of looks like me. Okay, all right. But I don't have a pony. Okay, so continuing on to the next page. Uh, Genghis Khan, the rise, okay, the rise of the Mongols. One measures greatness by the territory, meaning territories, uh, extent of a person's conquest. Then there can be no doubt at all that Genghis Khan was the greatest ruler in world history. So what that means is uh, under the Mongol control, the extent of the area of land was larger than the Roman conquest or uh, the Greek conquest. It just was the largest and it's been the largest, you know, even when Nazi Germany came around and took a lot of areas, it doesn't compare if you're looking at the territorial extent. Uh, he was originally named Temujin, but was given the title Genghis Khan, great king in later life. Before his death in 1227, he had come to rule a vast territory from the South Russian steppes to the China Sea. His sons and successors expanded the Mongol empire even farther until it was easily the largest the world had ever seen. Temujin was born about 1167 into a violent landscape and had to struggle almost from birth against harsh competitors. At the time of his birth, Mongolian life, typical of pastoralist nomads, centered around numerous tribes that warred against each other constantly. So again, you had all these different Mongol tribes and they're just fighting each other all the time. And you remember what they were fighting for, right? Food, water, livestock. Um, when they were not assaulting the richer lands of the Chinese and the Koreans, uh, Temujin enjoyed years of successful conquest in these tribal wars. Greatly feared for his ferocity, which means his violence in battle and ruthlessness, which uh, is along the lines of cruelty, right? being cruel. Uh, by 1196, he had become powerful enough to, uh, to assert personal control over all of the Mongolian tribes. He united all of them. In 1206, at a meeting of the Kuraltai, the, um, is this thing gonna work? What's going on here? There we are. The Grand Council of Clan Elders, the capital of Karakoram, he accepted the title of Great King, Genghis Khan, of the Mongols and imposed tight military order on his hundreds of thousands of followers. For the first time in their history, the Mongols were united under one leader. And I think Temujin in my class here, he wants to do that again. So I wish him luck. If he does take control over Mongolia, I hope he remembers me, his humble teacher, and gives me a condo in downtown Ulaanbaatar with some kind of salary. Thank you. Uh, next, Genghis Khan uh, combined traditional Mongol fighting methods with propaganda and new forms of organization to forge his armies into a remarkably efficient war machine, okay? It'll get into later about the propaganda, which is continuing to be used to this day by different uh, countries. First, he divided them into light and heavy cavalry. The light units relied purely on the swiftness of their horses and their light weapons, swords, bows, and arrows to make lightning strikes. The heavy cavalry units added Chinese-style armor to the usual light Mongol weapons, 
to maintain both political and military unity. Genghis never allowed his army to remain organized along traditional tribal lines, which means you've got all these guys from different tribes. You can't say, well, continue to follow your tribal, different tribal reliefs. No, he restructured it by mixing all of the tribal warriors into new units consisting of members from many different tribal and clan groups, but they had to believe in his way. The largest army unit, the two men, consisted of 10,000 men and was further divided into smaller tactical units of 1,110. So looks like he liked the unit of 10, right? So continuing. Chinggis and his generals also learned to make use of Chinese inventions like gunpowder and primitive or the first beginning guns to improve their proficiency in the art of the siege, which means the taking of a city. To keep the loss of life among his followers to a minimum, he deliberately encouraged the spread of rumors about Mongol blood dust. Now we're talking about the uh, propaganda. The fears these installed and demoralized opponents and the growing reputation of Mongol skills in battle and siege won many battles and cities without a shot having to be fired. For example, see the apocryphal quote attributed to Genghis at the head of this chapter, which really didn't bother with. There was a couple of um, Islamic scholars or chroniclers, and they describe the way the Mongols attacked the city and how they uh, destroy things and kill people. So that's what that's referring to. Now moving on to the conquests. Uh, the Mongol conquest proceeded in three phases. The first lasted from 1206, when Genghis and his army attacked China unsuccessfully uh, to his death in 1227, so 21 years later. The initial failure in China forced Genghis to direct his armies westward against the Turks and Persians. Proud cities such as Bukhara, Samarkand, and Herat, all centers of a rich Muslim civilization, were overwhelmed after desperate resistance, and their populations were massacred, which means when you talk about a massacre, usually nobody uh, survives. Everyone is uh, killed. Or some were enslaved, right? So became, uh, Muslim slaves, which is very common at the time. And if they were strong men, a lot of them became slaves into the Muslim army. Some cities, or I'm sorry, into the Mongol army here, but it also was in Islam too. So I guess around the world, that was a common practice. Uh, some cities would never recover their former wealth and importance. Mosques were turned into stables and libraries were burned. Never had such destruction been seen. Word of an approaching Mongol army sometimes was enough to inspire wholesale flight. Okay, this is some figurative writing here. What that means is just somebody saying something and it could have been a rumor but just saying hey we heard there's a big possibility that a mongol army is coming to the city soon was enough to make people flee or leave the city without even real proof they're like oh hell no because they, they heard about the destruction and then they started believing the extra propaganda that Genghis khan started having his armies use Everywhere, the invaders were feared for their reputed bloodthirstiness. Again, killing and shedding blood wasn't about killing people in an honorable way. And then this bloodthirstiness was usually aimed towards those who resisted. So the more you resisted, the worse your situation would become. And... Uh, they were despised as cultural inferior. So these high level societies, whether they were Chinese or Islamic, felt that they were truly, the Mongols were truly wild and barbaric people and culturally inferior. This was particularly true in China 
but also in the Christian and Muslim lands. Uh, Christian lands, they'll, they'll, they'll overrun later. Uh, many of the conquered territories had been under Persian Muslim rule for centuries and had developed a highly civilized lifestyle. Following these successes, Genghis headed north. In 1222, he crossed the Caspian Sea and raided southern Russia. He and the Mongols attacked Novgorod, again, striking so much fear into the Russians that they called, and I'll stop there because that's the end of the, this page. So you know I gotta fire some questions at you. All right. So let's go to the whiteboard. So we're going to move on to question four. Again, a long one for me. I have to check. Okay, stretchy pool time. Uh, I did it. Okay, when did Genghis Khan unite all the Mongol tribes? Now, I usually don't give um, a lot of dates and I try my best not to give any dates because, you know, even American students of history, they hate having to remember things like uh, 1492, December 7th, 1941, 1776, 1864. But this number, which I'm asking here, basically, what year was it that uh, Genghis Khan united all the tribes? It's stated so many times in the reading here, it should be easy for you. So just uh, give me the date. Okay. Question five, pencil, where are you? Okay. I can stress this. You want more word? Okay. After his first attack on China failed, which peoples did he attack next? So it clearly states which peoples these were. And don't be silly, don't say, well, Who's this guy here? I have no idea. What are we talking about? Are we talking about George Washington? You know what we're talking about? It's this guy right here. Okay. So let me give you a few on those.
Guys doing okay? You almost done there? Okay, I guess I'm gonna go for the eraser. All right. Repeating, when did Genghis Khan unite all the Mongol tribes? So please um, give me the date. Maybe the only date I'll ask for you, uh, ask of you in this uh, chapter. Five. After he first attack on China failed, which peoples did he attack next? So again, don't be the silly guys. Don't say, I think it was uh, Mexico. And then he attacked the US, mostly Vegas, because you know he wanted to take the money from the casinos at that time. Uh, please don't do that. Okay. Be good. All right. That's erased. I have to go back to the material. All right, so we ended up on the bottom here. Again, striking so much fear into the Russians that they called, and now we're gonna learn. What did they call? What can we, what can we find out here? Uh oh, this thing disappeared? Okay. Oh, we get a picture. Yay, we get another picture. You can see this is the Arabic writing. So we're probably gonna come from the Islamic kingdom. So let's read the caption. Genghis Khan, Genghis united the Mongol clan leaders for the first time in their history. And as of the first of the great Khans created a world empire that included much of the Eurasian landmass again that's why i was telling you that uh when we talk about persia we're also talking about their empire which extended far out reaching of their own country okay okay so they were called the russians called them the mongols what happy guys kind guys tennis players what did they call the mongols uh, the Mongols were called Tartars, people from hell. Is that true? Oh my God, that's pretty rough, right? However, it was Genghis' grandson, Batu, who completed the subjugation of Russia after 1238, which means he completely controlled them and they did whatever he said. They were subjugated uh, to him. And that's uh, after 1238. So we know that uh, uh, that was the beginning period. Uh, sated by these victories, so sated means you become full. Uh, Chinggis and his followers returned to Mongolia. See, they were full, so let's go back home. And gave the peoples to the West a temporary reprieve. Reprieve, reprieve is a high level word for rest. His stay in his homelands did not last very long though. And in 1227, he was again on the road to more battles. Uh-oh, so he got hungry again. That's what happens. Uh, not to be denied a victory and having failed once. So that also bothers people. They fail and then they get more powerful and they say, we gotta go back and go where we failed. We can do it this time. Uh, so again, having failed once, he launched a second invasion of Northern China. Again, the selective use of terror was applied as his most effective propaganda weapon. And he massacred all Chinese in his path who resisted, sometimes including women and children. And again, it's here as a as a, the document uh, from law and government as a Muslim describes the Mongol invasion. The warlord finally had conquered the entire world that was known to him at that time. Uh, there was no 
United States. Uh, there was no newspaper, no media. So uh, what was familiar with, with him was the East. And uh, he probably knew of Europe and then later his, his uh, descendants would then uh, start invading Europe. Uh, the warlord had finally conquered again the entire world that was known to him, which essentially included the grasslands of Mongolia, northern China, Turkestan, Afghanistan, Persia, and their empire, and Russia. And we know that uh, Russia is the largest country, landmass in the world. It's even larger than uh, China. His success in China was short lived, however, and his death in 1227 ended the first phase of Mongol eruption, so like a volcano erupting uh, and exploding, okay? So, okay, I'm gonna continue. Another picture here, a Mongol yurt. This is the, the yurt that I talked about earlier that's easy to disassemble and move on and restructure in an area where it's not too cold and they have some grasslands for the animals. At the time of the Mongol conquest, these tent-like shelters were ideal for a nomadic, warlike people who were constantly on the move. These yurts were made from felt, which provided relatively good insulation against all kinds of temperature extremes. Very intelligent folks for surviving in a severe winter. And from what I understand from my, my Mongolian students, their winters, uh, we don't have anything here in the United States that can compare to them. All right. By then, the Mongols believed that their great sky god, Tengri, had commanded them to conquer the entire world. And they came close to doing so in the second and third phases of their conquest. Chinggis' successors returned to Russia to add to the previous conquest and also defeated the Teutonic Knights of Germany along the way. So they were starting to get into Europe, driving them back almost to the walls of Vienna. The sudden death in 1241 of another great Khan, however, saved the city as the Mongols hastily, which means hurriedly and panically, retreated to Mongolia to choose a new leader. So that stopped them from, I guess, defeating the Germans completely all the way to Vienna. Afterwards, the Mongols under Genghis's grandson, Hulegu, returned to Persia and Iraq in 1251 and in 1258. You don't have to know those dates. The great city of the Caliphs. Caliphs are positions of high power in the Islamic world. Baghdad suffered the same fate as so many before it. What had been one of the greatest cities in the world was severely plundered. So when you plunder a place, you steal all that is of value. And maybe other things too that are not, but you take everything. So it's plundered uh, by Mongol troops or soldiers. Scholars have estimated that 80,000 of its citizens were killed. Again, that's what we're talking about, the bloodlust. Among these was the last Baghdad Caliph of a once proud and mighty Abbasid dynasty. So they're not only uh, defeating and destroying countries, but dynasties, empires, like I mentioned before with Persia. Along with his son and heir, the person who was going to take over for him. Some of the family managed to escape and flee westward to Egypt, where a much reduced caliphate was maintained for 250 years in a humbler or more humble state under the protection of an Egyptian sultanate. Okay, so I've read quite a lot, so let me squeeze a uh, question in there. Pencil. This will be question six.
Sorry, I can stretch this to a onesie. Oops, what happened there? There we go. Looking kind of funny. By 1227, which countries had Genghis conquered? Uh, see, I'm supplying the date here. You don't have to do that. Just tell me the countries, okay? So let me give you a set for that. So there's a list, and again, uh, as I repeat every quarter, let's say the list is uh, five countries. Uh, you give me one country, maybe you're a little bit lazy, or you know you don't want to pay attention that much. Uh, someone gives me three, they're getting more points than you. You don't have to give me all five, but if you do, ooh, the grade will be pretty good, you know. All right, so let me turn the air off again. I think I could be chilly for a bit. All right, so I erase your time. Erase this. Okay, go back to the material. All right, this is getting sensitive. There we go. So again, we went under the protection of an Egyptian sultanate. Next page, we go into the Mongol Empire and it's significant. So we're just trying to give it some meaning here. Okay. Not just, oh, well, they conquered. It's like, okay, well, can we discuss something about it? Or, you know, what's the dealio? So repeating the Mongol Empire and its significance. Uh, it would be easy to assume from their methods of waging war that the intrusion of the Mongols into the great centers of civilization, like those of Islam and China, brought only destruction. So we're trying to name some positive effects here, okay? While that often occurred during the initial conquests of new territories, changing the page here, once they settled down to governing their enormous empire, Mongol rule also opened up new opportunities for the traders and merchants or business people among the peoples they had conquered. For about a century, the so-called Pax Mongolica, aka the Mongolian peace, extended across many thousands of miles, all under the supervision of a great Khan or Karakoram or Beijing and the relatives and clan leaders he appointed as subordinates, people under him, to represent him. Goods could be transported from as far away as China in Southeast Asia to the towns of the Eastern Mediterranean with relative ease and safety, so long as a tribute or tax was paid to um, the Khan's agents. The conquest reopened the old Silk Road, which, you know, if you remember with China, the Silk Road was very, very important. Um, this was after it had been effectively shut down during centuries of warfare among the Turkmen tribes of Central and Western Asia. Now for the first and only time, um, all of mainland Asia, except Southern India, was under the rule of a single great power, the Mongols. The impact this had on world history was considerable indeed. Besides the transport of the usual goods Crucial new technologies passed from China to the West that paved the way or made way to the early European modern age. This influenced the West. The spinning wheel helped revolutionize textile making. The compass proved to be an invention of incalculable value 
to bold navigators. So the compass is what tells you to go east, west, north, or south. And sea captains such as De Gama from Portugal, Albuquerque from Portugal, Magellan, Spain, Columbus, uh, originally of Italy. You know, people think he was from Spain. It's just the Spanish king and queen gave him the power of Europe's age of discovery. So these things reached Europe due to the Mongols controlling and reopening the Silk Road. Um, European and Turkish improvements on Chinese inventions like gunpowder, primitive guns, and rockets eventually gave them superior weapons that enabled the Europeans to conquer and forge commercial empires that spanned the globe for the first time in history. Okay, so let me, uh, well, I can go a little bit more, but uh, yeah, I'll do that. And then I'll give you uh, two questions before I start the uh, yawn. Uh, yet hidden dangers lurked as more people were placed into direct contact with each other over vast distances. Besides spices, silks, precious metals, and other luxuries, microbial agents and diseases were passed from region to region to deadly effect. In the late Middle Ages, the Black Death, possibly a form of bubonic plague or anthrax, appeared first in Central Asia and then spread along the trade routes and devastated at least three great civilizations, those of China, Islamic Western Asia, and North Africa, and Europe. Other regions that also might have been affected are Southeastern Asia and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> Excuse me, I think I need a little whiskey. Okay, later still European and African diseases like smallpox and malaria destroyed most of the Native American civilizations of the New World. So all these things are trying to say are interconnected. So in that long reading passage, I have uh, two more questions for you, seven and eight. Whiteboard, pencil, question seven. So here's a shorter sentence, good for me. So question seven, what was the Pax Mongolia? Uh, let, me, let me give an extension on that. So it's a two-parter. So what was the Pax Mongolia and how far did it extend? How far did it reach? Um, I'll leave that as a twosie like that. It's going to help you better with answering both. So students don't get into the habit of making a mistake and just giving me one answer. So again, that's a two-parter. And then let me pop a question eight in there. Let me check on that. It's a little bit longer question. All right. I can try to stretch this one and I'm gonna uh, 
re-clarify something on seven. So I always try to make it really clear for my students. So uh, going back to seven, what was the Pax Mongolia? How far did it extend? We're looking at a time frame, okay? Time frame. So I don't want you confused with question eight. <laughs> Uh, eight, what reopened due to the Mongolian conquest? And tell me the importance of this or some important things that happened due to this reopening, okay? And um, I don't want my funny guys out there. I, 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 I'm more concentrated on the reopening of Disneyland, you know, the, the, the corona is always shut down. I wanna go back to Disneyland or Disney World. So please pay attention in class for this uh, reopening in history. So again, I'm getting hot. So I'm gonna turn this back on and let me give you a few to answer, seven and eight. Anything think you're getting a hold on those? I hope so. Okay. You grab the eraser. Repeating what was the Pax Mongolia? How far did it extend from what time until what time? Eight, what reopened due to the Mongolian conquest? And importance, again, we're not talking about Disneyland and Anaheim or Disney World. Right. So, so if we've answered seven and eight, then we need to need nine and ten. So we're, we're getting close to ending here. Back to the material. So we ended here. Uh, now we have to start the Yuan Dynasty in China. We have to revisit that. Uh, to administer the great expanse of territory. Genghis Khan installed members of his family in positions of command as he fought his way into Western Asia. After his death, his son and grandsons divided the huge empire among themselves. The richest part, China, went to the Yuan Dynasty, whose most illustrious member was Kublai Khan, the host of Marco Polo, right? If you remember Marco Polo, was a fellow that came from Italy and traveled through China and Asia. And he was a host. Uh, he was hosted by Kublai Khan. In 1279, Kublai completed the conquest of China that had begun under Genghis Khan. For half a century, the Chinese had made successful use of gunpowder to keep the Mongols at bay, which means keep them back, right? They developed an early primitive type of gun called the fire lance, which permitted them to discharge several arrows at once against their fearsome att attackers. It was more than several, it was a lot of arrows and they were on fire. So just imagine you pull back the lever and let it go versus the guy one arrow, two arrows, how slow that is. This weapon had given them an edge for a while, but it figuratively backfired when the Mongols learned the secrets of the new weapon and used it themselves. So I have a feeling um, some person told them the secrets, you know, for some money, how to make this same weapon. And then once the Mongols learned how to use it or make it, then it was over, no more advantage. Uh, Kublai and his followers tried to transform China into their notion or thinking or idea of what a land should be. 
one that resembled the grassy steppe lands from whence they had come in Mongolia. Not fully understanding agriculture, they plowed up productive farmland to graze their horses and camels. So uh, productive farmland would have grown all kinds of vegetables, but instead they wanted to make it a grassland just for their horses and camels. Uh, one sage advisor, which we, a sage is a very intelligent like philosopher, advisor to Kublai, however, finally recognized the wastefulness of such measures and convinced the great Khan to abandon his behavior. After all, farmers who were allowed to cultivate could produce tribute. Tribute means honor in a monetary or production form. Prevented from following their livelihood, they could produce nothing, right? So didn't make a lot of sense, you know? Uh, I can give you a similar kind of way. I had a friend, uh, that he owned a record store in this uh, business complex. And uh, what happens a lot and what's happening a lot now is you have an older fellow, let's say the father who's owned these businesses he, and he rents them out to various businesses, restaurants, what have you, for many, many years. And he's a pretty cool guy. And he's made his money and he retired, but he didn't take advantage of anybody. And he gives it to his son because he dies or he just wills it to his son. And the son has some marketer go in there and the marketer says, shit, what do you, you know, your dad only charged them, uh, you know, 1,000 a, a month for rent. Uh, our statistics show that with all the uh, population here, you could easily charge 3,000. So uh, the greedy son starts charging everybody 3,000 and he lose all the businesses and nobody can rent there. Now everything's a wasteland, right? So same kind of thing. So we're at the bottom here. So I'm gonna sneak in question nine. And so, Let me see how far I can stretch this. Probably have to make it a 2 -Z. A little bit more. There we go. Uh, in 1279, here again, I'm supplying the dates. What a kind teacher. So you can, like what uh, Genghis and his uh, successors wanted, uh, tribute. So you can give me some tribute. Uh, in 1279, which successor finally completed the conquest of northern China? So that's the only one I'm trying to sneak in there. All right, so let me give you a few to do that. That means we're only going to have one question left, which is great. All right. Let me get the eraser. So I don't even repeat this. I just said it. So that's done. All right. Material. We ended here at the bottom, said that they could produce nothing. All right. Yeah, one more question to do. So this should be the last of our reading. Moreover, the Mongols soon learned to rely more on the Chinese and their institutions for help in governing. This helped them govern the Chinese people more successfully. This is what they were used to. China during the years of Yuan rule was divided into a hierarchy which, uh, with Mongol officials 
called stamp wielders at the top. The old Confucian examination system of earlier dynasties was discarded or thrown away. The Mongols fought against assimilation, which means they did not want to assimilate with the Chinese people if they could avoid it. To find suitably educated people to staff government positions, they relied on foreigners more than on their Chinese subjects, and they accorded foreigners a higher status and supervisory authority over the old Mandarin elites. Wow. So not only are the Mongols governing you, but they're saying on a daily basis, we're going to bring foreigners in here to govern you. Many of these foreign recruits were Muslims. So Islam began making significant inroads into the eastern parts of China at this time. So that's how you find different areas of China with uh, mosques and Islamic people. This is where it began. In addition to the far west, the fact that Kublai preferred foreigners over the native Chinese explains why Marco Polo, a stranger, a foreign stranger, was given an important position when he visited the court of Kublai Khan from 1275 to 1292. So he stayed there 17 years in Mongolia. Is it possible he dated one Mongolian girl? I don't know. Um, the Mongols could not long remain entirely resistant to Chinese influences, however. Uh, Confucianism, the philosophy of Confucianism, while not, uh oh, looks like the bottom are reading, yay, encouraged was at least tolerated. So they didn't encourage it, the Mongols, they didn't destroy it, but they kind of put up with it. The universalism of Buddhism proved to be more appealing to the Mongols and the native Chinese religions and philosophy. And even though the Mongols continued to segregate themselves from the Chinese, keep them separate, that faith found many converts among them. So many Mongolians became Buddhists. The uh, Pax Mongolia also meant that Yuan rule was a time of considerable prosperity or success for China, just as it was throughout the rest of the empire. It marked the end of further invasions from the north, a time of peace for a huge swath or area of territory, and the peaceful passage of merchants and caravans. So business people and long business uh, vehicles go on through. And this proved to be an enormous boon or success that helped offset the terrors of the initial invasion. So what that says is, with all the terror and the terrible things of initial invasions, once the Mongols settled down, uh, there was benefits to be had under their rule and a certain amount of peace. So if we've finished the last of the reading, I got to throw in the last question. Question 10, the last one for today. Whiteboard, pencil, okay. Is it gonna be a long one, Dad gummit? See about the stretching here. Can I make it a Tuesday? Yes. Okay. Uh, the Mongols, as I stated a few times, resisted Chinese influence. But which things, which Chinese things came in or made it into the Mongol uh, culture there? So let me give you a few for that. That's our last question for the day. We've also finished the reading. I hope everybody's ready to start a new and uh, extra hot August. That'll be strong. Before you know it, I'll be talking to you and it'll be September. So, and cooler. That'll be a great thing.
Okay, you're done for that last question? You got that? I'm sure you wanna get out of here, right? And end for the day. All right, so let me take the eraser to it. I won't even repeat it. Come on, eraser. Okay, there we go. Actually, let me hit the screensaver. Stop sharing. There we are. Okay, so we've ended it for today. And this is for August the 2nd, uh, 2021. So I hope everybody uh, has a good rest of the week and take care of yourselves, okay? Keep on wearing your masks and try to get your shots, all right? Thank you, and I'll see you next week.